Chapter 15. The Cauliflower Robbery Master, a gift for you. These six huge cauliflowers were planted with my hands. I have watched over their growth with the tender care of a mother nursing her child. I presented the basket of vegetables with a ceremonial flourish. Thank you. Sri Yukteswar's smile was warm with appreciation. Please keep them in your room. I shall need them tomorrow for a special dinner. I had just arrived in Puri to spend my college summer vacation with my guru at a seaside hermitage. Built by Master and his disciples, the cheerful little two-storied retreat fronts on the Bay of Bengal. I woke early the following morning, refreshed by the salty sea breezes and the charm of my surroundings. Sri Yukteswar's melodious voice was calling. I took a look at my cherished cauliflowers and stowed them neatly under my bed. Come, let us go to the beach, Master led the way. Several young disciples and myself followed in a scattered group. Our guru surveyed us in mild criticism. When our western brothers walk, they usually take pride in unison. Now please march in two rows, keep rhythmic step with one another. Sri Yakteswar watched as we obeyed. He began to sing, Boys go to and fro in a pretty little row. I could not but admire the ease by which Master was able to match the burst pace of his young students. Halt, my guru's eyes sought mine. Did you remember to lock the back door of the hermitage? A steady stream of visitors poured from the world into the hermitage tranquility. A number of learned men came with the expectation of meeting an orthodox religionist. A supercilious smile or a glance of amused tolerance occasionally betrayed that the newcomers anticipating nothing more than a few pious platitudes. Yet their reluctant departure would bring an express conviction that Sri Yukteswar had shown precise insight into their specialized fields of knowledge. My guru always had young resident disciples in his hermitage. He directed their minds and lives with that careful discipline in which the word disciple is etymologically rooted. I think so, sir. Sri Yukteswar was silent for a few minutes, a half-suppressed smile on his lips. No, you forgot, he said finally. Divine contemplation must not be made an excuse for material carelessness. You have neglected your duty in safeguarding the ashram. You must be punished. I thought he was obscurely joking when he added, Your six cauliflowers will soon be only five. We turned around at Master's orders and marched back until we were close to the hermitage. Rest a while, Mukunda. Look across the compound on our left. Observe the road beyond. A certain man will arrive there presently. He will be the means of your chastisement. I concealed my vexation at his incomprehensible remarks. A peasant soon appeared at the road. He was dancing grotesquely and flinging his arms about with meaningless gestures. Almost paralyzed with curiosity, I glued my eyes on the hilarious spectacle. As the man reached a point in the road where he would vanish from our view, Sri Yukteswar said, Now he will return. The peasant once changed his direction and made for the rear of the ashram. Crossing a sandy track, he entered the building by the back door. I had left it unlocked, even as my guru had said. The man emerged shortly, holding one of my prized cauliflowers. He now strode along respectfully, invested with a dignity of possession. The unfolding farce in which my role appeared to be that one of a bewildered victim was not so disconcerting that I failed in indignant pursuit. I was halfway to the road when Master recalled me. He was shaking from head to foot with laughter. The poor crazy man has been longing for a cauliflower, he explained between outbursts of mirth. I thought it would be a good idea if he got one of yours, so ill-guarded. I dashed to my room where I found that the thief, evidently one with a vegetable fixation, had left untouched my golden rings, watch, and money, all lying openly on the blanket. He had crawled instead under the bed where, completely hidden from casual sight, one of my cauliflowers had aroused his single-hearted desire. I asked Sri Yukteswar that evening to explain the incident which had, I thought, a few baffling features. My guru shook his head slowly. You will understand it some day. Science will soon discover a few of these hidden laws. When the wonders of radio burst some years later on the astounded world, I remembered Master's prediction. Age-old concepts of time and space were annihilated. No peasant's home so narrow that London or Calcutta could not enter. The dullest intelligence enlarged before indisputable proof of one aspect of man's omnipresence. The plot of the cauliflower comedy can be best understood by a radio analogy. Sri Yukteswar was a perfect human radio. Thoughts are no more than very gentle vibrations moving in the ether. Just as a sensitized radio picks up a desired musical number out of a thousand of other programs from every direction, 
so my guru had been able to catch the thought of the half-witted man who hankered for a cauliflower, out of the countless thoughts of broadcasting human wills in the world. By his powerful will, Master was also a human broadcasting station, and had successfully directed the peasant to reverse his steps and go to a certain room for a single cauliflower. Intuition is soul guidance, appearing naturally in man during these instants when his mind is calm. Nearly everyone has had the experience of an inexplicably correct hunch, or has transferred his thoughts effectively to another person. The human mind, free from the static of restlessness, can perform through its antenna of intuition all the functions of complicated radio mechanisms, sending and receiving thoughts and tuning out undesirable ones. As the power of a radio depends on the amount of electrical current it can utilize, so the human radio is energized according to the power of will possessed by each individual. All thoughts vibrate eternally in the cosmos. By deep concentration, a master is able to detect the thoughts of any mind, living or dead. Thoughts are universally and not individually rooted. A truth cannot be created, but only perceived. The erroneous thoughts of man result from imperfections in his discernment. The goal of yoga science is to calm the mind, that without distortion it may mirror the divine vision in the universe. Radio and televisions have brought the instantaneous sound and sight of remote persons to the firesides of millions, the first faint scientific intimations that man is an all-pervading spirit. Not a body confined to a point in space, but the vast soul, which the ego in most barbaric modes conspires in vain to cramp. Very strange, very wonderful, seemingly very improbable phenomena may yet appear which, once established, will not astonish us more than we now are astonished at all that science has taught us during the last century. Charles Robert Rickey, Nobel Prizeman in Physiology, has declared, it is assumed that the phenomena, which we now accept without surprise, do not excite our astonishment because they are understood. But this is not the case. If they do not surprise us, it is not because they are understood, it is because they are familiar. For if that which is not understood ought to surprise us, we should be surprised at everything. The fall of a stone thrown in the air, the acorn which becomes an oak, mercury which expands when it is heated, iron attracted by a magnet, phosphorus which it burns when it is rubbed. The science of today is a light matter. The revolution and evolution, which it will experience in a hundred thousand years, will far exceed the most daring anticipation. The truth, though surprising, amazing, unforeseen truth, which our descendants will discover, are even now all around us, staring us in the eyes, so to speak, and yet we do not see them. But it is not enough to say that we do not see them. We do not wish to see them, for as soon as an unexpected and unfamiliar fact appears, we try to fit it into the framework of the commonplace of acquired knowledge, and we are indignant that anyone should dare to experiment further. A humorous occurrence took place a few days after I had been so implausibly robbed of my cauliflower. A certain kerosene lamp could not be found. Having so lately witnessed my guru's omniscient insight, I thought he would demonstrate that it was child's play to locate the lamp. Master perceived my expectation. With exaggerated gravity, he questioned all ashram residents. A young disciple confessed that he had used the lamp to go to the well in the backyard. Sri Yukteswar gave the solemn counsel, Seek the lamp near the well. I rushed there, no lamp. Crestfallen, I returned to my guru. He was now laughing heartily, without compunction for my disillusionment. Too bad I couldn't direct you to the vanished lamp. I am not a fortune teller. With twinkling eyes, he added, I am not even a satisfactory Sherlock Holmes. I realized that Master would never display his powers when challenged, or for triviality. Delightful weeks sped by. Sri Yukteswar was planning a religious procession. He asked me to lead the disciples over the town in a beach of purity. The festive day dawned as one of the hottest of the summer. Guruji, how can I take the barefooted students over the fiery sands? I spoke despairingly. I will tell you a secret, Master responded. The Lord will send an umbrella of clouds. You all shall walk in comfort. I happily organized the procession. Our group started from the ashram with a satsanga banner. Designed by Sri Yukteswar, it bore the symbol of the single eye, the telescopic gaze of intuition. No sooner had we left the hermitage than the part of the sky which was overhead became filled with clouds as though by magic. To the accompaniment of astonished ejaculations from all sides, a very light shower fell cooling the city streets and the burning seashore. 
The soothing drops descended during the two hours of parade. The exact instant at which our group returned to the ashram, the clouds and rain passed away tracelessly. You see how God feels for us, Master replied, after I had expressed my gratitude. The Lord responds to all and works for all. Just as he sent rain at my plea, so he fulfills any sincere desire of the devotee. Seldom do men realize how often God hears their prayers. He is not partial to a few, but listens to everyone who approaches him trustfully. His children should ever have implicit faith in the loving kindness of their omnipresent Father. Sri Yukteswar sponsored four yearly festivals at the equinoxes and the solstices, when his students gathered from afar and near. The winter solstice celebration was held in Sirampur. The first one I attended left me with a permanent blessing. The festivity started in the morning with a barefoot procession along the streets. The voice of a hundred students rang out with sweet religious songs. A few musicians played the flute and coal cartel. Enthusiastic townspeople strewed the path with flowers, glad to be summoned from prosaic tasks by a resounding praise of the Lord's blessed name. The long tour ended in the courtyard of the hermitage. There were encircled our guru, while students of upper balcony showered us with marigold blossoms. Many guests went upstairs to receive a pudding of chana and oranges. I made my way to a group of brother disciples who were serving today as cooks. Food for such large gathering had to be cooked outdoors in huge cauldrons. The improvised wood-burning brick stoves were smoky and tear-provoking, but we laughed merrily at our work. Religious festivals in India are never considered troublesome. Each one does his part, supplying money, rice, vegetables, or his personal services. Master was soon in our midst, supervising the details of the feast. Busy every moment, he kept pace with the most energetic young student. A Sankirtan, accompanied by the harmonian and hand-playing Indian drums, was in the process on the second floor. Sri Yukteswar listened appreciatively. His musical sense was acutely perfect. There off key, Master left the cooks and joined the artist. The melody was heard again, this time correctly rendered. In India, music as well as painting and the drama is considered a divine art. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the Eternal Trinity, were the first musicians. The divine dancer Shiva is scripturally represented as having worked out the infinite modes of rhythm in his cosmic dance of universal creation, preservation, and dissolution. While Brahma accentuated the time beat with the clanging cymbals, and Vishnu sounded the holy madanga or drum, Krishna, an incarnation of Vishnu, is always shown in Hindu art with a flute, on which he plays the enrapturing song that recalls to their true home the human souls wandering in the Maya delusion. Saraswati, goddess of wisdom, is symbolized as performing on the vina, mother of all stringed instruments. The Sama Veda of India contains the world's earliest writings on musical science. The foundation stone of Hindu music is the ragas, or fixed melodic scales. The six basic ragas branch out into 126 derivative rajinas, wives, and putra, sons. Each raga has a minimum of five notes. A leading note, vadi or king. A secondary note, samavadi or prime minister. Helping notes, anuvadi, attendants. And a dissonant note, vivadi, the enemy. Each one of the six basic ragas has a natural correspondence with a certain hour of the day season of the year and a presiding deity who bestows a particular potency. Thus, the Hindu raga is heard only at dawn in the spring to evoke the mood of universal love. Deepaka raga is played during the evening in summer to arouse compassion. Mega raga is a melody for midday in the rainy season to summon courage. Bhairava raga is played in the mornings of August, September, October to achieve tranquility. Shri Raga is reserved for autumn twilights to attain pure love. Malkunsa Raga is heard at midnight in winter for valor. The ancient rishis discovered these laws of sound alliance between nature and man, because nature is an objectification of Om, the primal sound or vibratory word. Man can obtain control over all natural manifestations through the use of certain mantras or chants. Historical documents tell all the remarkable powers possessed by Mayam Tan Sen, 16th century court musician for Akbar the Great, commanded by the emperor to sing a night raga while the sun was overhead. 
Tansen intoned a mantra which instantly caused the whole palace precincts to become enveloped in darkness. India music divides the octave into 22 shrutis, or demi-semitones. These microtonal intervals permit five shades of musical expression unattainable by the Western chromatic scale of 12 semitones. Each one of the seven basic notes of the octave is associated in Hindu mythology with a color and the natural cry of a bird or beast, doe with green, the peacock, ray with red, and the skylark, me with golden, and the goat, fowl with yellowish white, and the heron, soul with black, and the nightingale, law with yellow, and the horse, sea with a combination of all colors, and the elephant. Three scales major, harmonic minor, melodic minor, are the only ones which Occidental music employs, but Indian music outlines 72 thatas or scales. The musician has a creative scope for endless improvisation around the fixed traditional melody or raga. He concentrates on the sentiment or definitive mode of the structural theme and then embroiders it to the limits of its own originality. The Hindu musician does not read set notes. He clothes anew at each plane the bare skeleton of the raga, often confining himself to a single melodic sequence stressing by repetition all of its subtle microtonal and rhythmic variations. Bach, among Western composers, had an understanding of the charm and power of repetition sound slightly differentiated in a hundred complex ways. Ancient Sanskrit literature describes 120 talas, or time measures. The traditional founder of Hindu music, Bharata, is said to have isolated 32 kinds of tala in a song of a lark. The origin of tala or rhythm is rooted in human movements, the double time of walking, and the triple time of respiration and sleep, when inhalation is twice the length of exhalation. India has always recognized the human voice as the most perfect instrument of sound. Hindu music, therefore, largely confines itself to the voice range of three octaves. For the same reason, melody, relation of successive notes, is stressed, rather than harmony, relation of simultaneous notes. The deeper aim of the early Rishi musicians was to blend the singer with a cosmic song which can be heard through awakening of man's occult spinal centers. Indian music is a subjective, spiritual, and individualistic art, aiming not at sympathetic brilliance, but at personal harmony with the oversoul. The Sanskrit word for musician is Bhagavathar, he who sings the praises of God. The Sankirtans, or musical gatherings are an effective form of yoga or spiritual discipline, necessitating deep concentration, intense absorption in the seed, thought, and sound. Because man himself is an expression of the creative word, sound has the most potent and immediate effect on him, offering a way to remembrance of his divine origin. The sun curtain, issuing from Sri Yukteswar's second-story sitting room on the day of the festival, was inspiring to the cooks amidst the steaming pots. My brother disciples and I joyously sang the refrains, beating time with our hands. By sunset we had served our hundreds of visitors with kirchral, rice and lentils, vegetable curry and rice pudding. We laid cotton blankets over the courtyard. Soon the assemblage was squatting under the starry vault, quietly attentive to the wisdom pouring from Sri Yukteswar's lips. His public speeches emphasized the value of Kriya Yoga and a life of self-respect calmness, determination, simple diet and regular exercise. A group of very young disciples then chanted a few sacred hymns. The meeting concluded with San Curtain. From ten o'clock until midnight, the ashram residents washed pots and pans and cleared the courtyard. My guru called me to his side. I am pleased over your cheerful labors today and during the past week of preparations. I want you with me. You may sleep in my bed tonight. This was a privilege I had never thought would fall to my lot. We sat a while in a state of intense divine tranquility. Hardly ten minutes after we had gotten to bed, Master rose and began to dress. What is the matter, sir? I felt a tinge of unreality in the unexpected joy of sleeping beside my guru. I think that a few students who missed their proper train connections will be here soon. Let us have some food ready. Guru Jay, no one would come at one o'clock in the morning. Stay in bed. You have been working very hard, but I am going to cook. At Sri Yukteswar's resolute tone, I jumped up and followed him to the small, daily-used kitchen, adjacent to the second-floor inner balcony. Rice and dot were soon boiling. 
My guru smiled affectionately. Tonight you have conquered fatigue and fear of hard work. You shall never be bothered by them in the future. As he uttered these words of lifelong blessing footsteps sounded in the courtyard, I ran downstairs and admitted a group of students. Dear brother, how reluctant we are to disturb master at this hour. One man addressed me apologetically. We made a mistake about train schedules, but felt we could not return home without a glimpse of our guru. He has been expecting you, is even now preparing your food. Sri Yukteswar's welcoming voice rang out. I led the astonished visitor to the kitchen. Master turned to me with twinkling eyes. Now that you have finished comparing notes, no doubt you are satisfied that our guests really did miss the train. I followed him to his bedroom a half hour later, realizing fully that I was about to sleep beside a godlike guru. End of chapter.